We are looking over these three evenings at poems that warn us as to who or what we might be becoming as individuals or society. This evening we hear Louis McNeese's poem, Prayer Before Birth, written in 1944, in which an unborn child is praying. I am not yet born, O oh, hear me. Let not the blood-sucking bat, or the rat, or the stoat, or the club-footed ghoul come near me. I am not yet born, console me. I fear that the human race may with tall walls wall me, with strong drugs dope me, with wise lies lure me, on black racks rack me, in bloodbaths roll me. I am not yet born. Provide me with water to dandle me, grass to grow for me, trees to talk to me, sky to sing to me, birds and a white light in the back of my mind to guide me. I am not yet born. Forgive me for the sins that in me the world shall commit. My words when they speak me, my thoughts when they think me, my treason engendered by traitors beyond me, my life when they murder by means of my hands, my death when they live me. I am not yet born. Rehearse me in the parts I must play and the cues I must take when old men lecture me, bureaucrats hector me, mountains frown at me, lovers laugh at me, the white waves call me to folly and the desert calls me to doom and the beggar refuses my gift and my children curse me. I am not yet born, oh hear me, let not the man who is beast or who thinks he is God come near me. I am not yet born. O oh, fill me with strength against those who would freeze my humanity, would dragoon me into a lethal automaton, would make me a cog in a machine, a thing with one face, a thing and against all those who would dissipate my entirety, would blow me like thistledown hither and thither, or hither and thither, like water held in the hands would spill me. Let them not make me a stone, and let them not spill me, otherwise kill me. The English poet of the First World War, Wilfred Owen, once said that all a poet can do today is warn. That is why he said the true poets must be truthful. Louis McNeese, writing Prayer Before Birth some years later during the Second World War, agreed with Owen. In fact, this poem powerfully embodies Owen's plea for honesty and forewarning. McNeese was born in Belfast to a father who was to become a Church of Ireland bishop. My father made the walls resound. He wore his collar the wrong way round, he says in one poem. And a mother who, suffering depression, entered a nursing home when he was six years old and whom he never saw again due to her death shortly afterwards from tuberculosis. McNeese's childhood naturally had a shaping effect on the person he became in adult life. He was a detached outsider, skeptical of God, of fixed systems and abstractions, an acute observer. 
with, but not strictly of, the company, as his work colleague put it. Like many individualists in a world threatened by fascism, communism, and the lies that war creates, as we are seeing today, McNeese could see that his personal values, such as he could fathom them, were becoming less relevant and in jeopardy. He was also doubtful of any armchair reformists, or as we might call them, virtue signalers. In 1944, he published Prayer Before Birth, in which the poet takes on the persona of an unborn child. It is a poem to read out loud, so you can fully grasp the assonance of images such as tall walls, wise lies, and black racks. Although it is free verse with lines and verses of varying lengths and rhyme patterns, the high level of repetition and the use of the word me as the last word of the first and last line of each stanza gives a very strong rhythmic backbone to the whole. Indeed, the poem is struggling hard to keep me in the picture when so much is working against me. Each stanza except the last is a single sentence and again there's almost a crazed litany feel to the poem, an anguished plea from the other side of the womb. The repeated oh cry as well as the statement I am not yet born alongside the frequent alliteration, give it almost a religious formality as it evokes God or maybe the powers of the universe. But this is a protest poem, not only against war, but against the raw animal in nature and in humanity. In the first stanza, where the unborn child asks to be heard, he prays that the nocturnal blood-sucking bat, rat and stoat don't come near. The child needs consoling because of fears that the human race also will, with deadly drugs and clever lies, wall him in, dope him, lure, rack and roll him in blood. Innocent nature is juxtaposed with such violence and bloodlust as he asks for water and grass and trees and sky and birds and light to guide him. The child seems to know the power that human life will have over him once he's born and asks for forgiveness for when the world, rather than himself and his conscience, speaks through him. He can see the opposition he will face from old men lecturing him and bureaucrats hectoring and lovers laughing at him and even his children cursing him. And then, of course, there is a very direct reference to those European dictators that were in full flow as this poem was written. Let not the man who is beast or who thinks he is God come near me. He wants no part in a collaboration with totalitarian regimes that thrive on fear and regimentation, but realizes that being humane is, as it were, not for beginners. It requires resilience and courage and an inner compass of steel. The poem is full of imperatives as the child calls for help. Of course, we can think of these men who are beasts and think they are God in our own day. There are plenty of them and maybe one or two more before long. And because they all in their way shape the world and shape the way we think and behave, we must, as Christians here, ensure whose kingdom we are ultimately breathing and living in whose language we use, whose worldview we consent to, whose aspirations and ideals and moral vision 
we strive for. Caesar and God are, at the end of the day, not on the same side of the coin. Finally, the child prays that he will be filled with strength and be able to stand up against all those people, systems, and ideologies that would simmer down human life by categorizing it, making it an automaton or lost in the crowd, all those things that, he says, would freeze my humanity. At the end, he asks that the world will not harden him into an unfeeling animal or spill him like something easily wasted and expendable. If this is going to happen, he ends eerily, then kill me. Whether McNeese's view of humanity is too dark and negative is debatable, although the times in which he wrote surely allowed him to see the real consequences of our potential for evil. It is one of the hard lessons of Christian faith that just as standing in a garage doesn't make you a car, so sitting in a church doesn't make you a Christian. It is the transformation of the heart and mind and the translation of that change into our behavior that the gospel invites us to. This means that from time to time, in sometimes small, sometimes courageous ways, we have to take a stand and confront what is unjust. This is sometimes called speaking truth to power, but it's not as simple as that, because often those who have the power already know the truth, but are choosing to ignore it or reframe it. So often the powerful, including those who write the political scripts we hear, or the adverts we read, have hypnotized the culture. So that one of the vocations of the church is to carefully scrutinize what everyone is getting excited about at a certain time, or what everybody just takes for granted as being common sense. It's all part of Heaney's undeceiving the world. What keys do you hold to open doors for people? Because I promise you, you have them. Christian witness often has the reputation for being pushy and know it all. In the Bible, though, the ones who end up speaking for God and God's justice are usually pretty unsure of themselves. Moses stammered, Jeremiah was melancholic at best, Jonah ran off, and Isaiah was convinced he was utterly unworthy. Many of us Christians are introverts at home in the inner landscape and not naturally keen to put our neck out. We cannot escape the call, though, to confront what is corrupt. This may be an injustice at work or the need to speak up for someone who's voiceless. Christians then need to make our fears our agenda because it is fear that so often stops us from witnessing to what is right and good. It's so much easier to yak on about churchy politics and titbits. Fear of the bully, of our reputation, of upsetting someone, of being isolated. These are all genuine anxieties and need to be recognized by us first if justice is to ever win the day. How do we undo the illusions of the day without becoming disillusioned? The answer for me is by faith in the gospel that ruptures the stale and unforgiving landscape with potential and promise. The gospel is not some sort of fire insurance policy for the next world. It is a life assurance policy for this one. I was very moved and humbled 
to hear Geoffrey John on the radio a few years back say this. I have a memory from my school days that still haunts me. One year we had a boy in our class, I'll call him David. He was a pathetic kid, weedy, rather effeminate, and his life was hell. Children can be incredibly cruel to anyone who's different, and David was a brilliant target. He was beaten up, he got his lunch thrown away, he got called girls' names, and he always sat on his own. I can hardly think of the misery that kid must have gone through. Now, I never beat him up. I never called him names. The fact it was happening used to churn my stomach. But I never said or did a thing to help him. Because, of course, I was terrified that if I did, they'd turn on me too, and I'd get the same treatment. And, of course, that's how it works in so many bad situations in the world. And, yes, in the church too. We know what's happening is wrong, but we keep our heads down and hope someone else will do the martyr bit and face down the bullies with the truth. There is a way of being human that does not allow fear to be the last word. Those we admire most are usually those who live with this integrity where belief and behavior coincide. Jesus was constantly being criticized and was eventually executed for interrupting the unchallenged narratives of the powerful with the truth and dignity of the vulnerable and overlooked. He did not so much answer questions as question answers. And to follow him means to do the same in our day and in our own way. We're told not to meddle in politics as if faith is not about real life. But if Jesus was just a nice guy, why did they execute him? As a Franciscan blessing invokes, may God bless us with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths and superficial relationships. May God bless us with anger at injustice, oppression and exploitation May God bless us with enough foolishness to believe that we can make a difference in this world, doing in his name what others claim cannot be done. To read a poem such as Prayer Before Birth helps us see just what forces, conscious and unconscious, can be at work in us and the world at large. It can help us recall that human beings have a will. Recently, I gave a talk to a clergy conference and an elderly priest got up and said he had something to say, something to tell everyone. He had, he said, just been in hospital after a heart attack. And as he lay on the hospital bed, he said, in his words, my whole life flashed before me. But the thing is, I wasn't in it. I realized I have not been in my own life. I've been absorbed, hiding. I've been full of fear. Please, my brothers and sisters, he said, don't let this be you. He seemed to be saying, I am not yet born, even though over 70 years had passed. His was not the prayer of the unborn child. It was the prayer of one nearing the other journey we take in life. I am not yet born. Oh, fill me with strength against those that would freeze my humanity, would dragoon me into a lethal automaton would make me a cog in a machine, a thing with one face, a thing. You might like to know that Louis McNeese died at the age of 56 
and after a funeral at St. John's Wood Church in London, his remains were taken back to Ireland and placed next to his mother. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and a perfect end. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. Most merciful God, we confess to you before the whole company of heaven and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and in what we have failed to do. Forgive us our sins, heal us by your Spirit, and raise us to new life in Christ. Amen. May the God of love and power forgive you and free you from your sins, heal and strengthen you by his Spirit, and raise you to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen.
I will pour out a spirit of compassion and supplication on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that when they look on the one whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. Let us pray. For all who are leading their life well, all who are waiting for that moment of new birth, for all approaching the new birth that is baptism, for all approaching the new birth that is death, for all who walk in the valley of the shadow of death and in the land of darkness, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer for all who are poured out, for all who are cogs in the machine, for all who are made a thing, for all who make themselves and others such. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer for all in positions of authority and influence. Grant us common wealth and common good. 
for ourselves and our own voice in society. Grant that by your Spirit we may enliven others' humanity and our own. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our fears, for the things and people we fear, for all driven to destruction by fear, for all driven to forgetfulness by it. For the fears we have by your grace put behind us. For the love and peace we have discovered. That we may know that love and peace, that hope and confidence this day and all the days of our lives. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. For those we love, for those we find most difficult, especially when they are the same person. For those for whom we worry, for those we would rather forget, for all on whom we depend, for all whom we pour out in order to live a little easier. For all in need of God's mercy this night. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, may we, by the prayer and discipline of Lent, enter into the mystery of Christ's sufferings, that by following in the way, we may come to share in the glory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May God bless us, that in us may be found love and humility, obedience and thanksgiving, discipline, gentleness and peace. Amen.